I have a um, mobile office in Kansas City uh, where incidentally the Ford Motor Company has a plant there that produces uh, the escape hybrid. But my, uh, my mobile unit runs on vegetable oil, uh, which costs about 70 cents a gallon. Now, it is true that you sometimes smell like a Big Mac, but... <laughs> How's that for your diet? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, 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 when you, I, I agree with you, and I brought this up because I, I think that there probably should be a... I mean, we should use every available uh, source of reducing our dependence on foreign oil. And I think we make a terrible mistake if we think that we, we can solve this problem simply by getting more plug-in hybrids or uh, E85 or, uh, you know, any other flex fuel vehicles. There's a problem that I'd like one of you, to, someone to address. When we use flex fuels, the, the engines are not calibrated to operate optimally for any of them. Uh, and so the more we, we, we talk about flex fuels, we're also talking about not getting the car, putting cars on the road that are, that are operating uh, at their optimum. Is, is that a concern that I should discard? Well, what is the object of the exercise? From, from my perspective, the object of the exercise is reducing the amount of oil that we rely upon to power our transportation fleet. If we have alternatives to oil, that may be used less efficiently in some respects, but that are indigenously available, that, that we're getting from products. And, and I would add to your ethanol question the obvious immediate opportunities of sugarcane-based ethanol coming from sources other than dangerous Wahhabists and Islamofascists in the Middle East, for example, in Latin America. Also, the, the possibility that we will shortly see cellulosic ethanol become a real contributor. These are, these are, in other words, alternative sources of fuel that we, you may be well right, are not as efficiently used or that we consume more of than we might consume oil on a per mile basis. But yet, if the object of the exercise is to stop transferring wealth to people who are trying to kill us, I think that's a good trade-off to be making, and you're absolutely right. It's flexible fuel, and these alternative fuels are just one piece of a comprehensive approach that we call, in the Set America Free Coalition, fuel choice. Thank you. I can Great. The, uh, I thought I'd catch you talking. I could slip <laughs> another one in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bo, is uh, there a conversion kit available for those of us who drive a, a Toyota Highlander hybrid? Uh, not at this point in time. We, we do have plans to expand uh, which modules we have available. We, we do have a Ford Escape and uh, we do have the, the Prius in small scale, but we're in the, in the process of, of completing testing and then scaling up from there into different models. Would you, would you keep me on your mailing list? We'll do that for sure. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, Mr. Lowe or others, um, I have a, a, a vision uh, in the world of West Wing that uh, if uh, confronted with a recalcitrant Congress, that I could envision a president um, issuing an executive order that he's not going to wait for them, that since the Department of Defense is the largest consumer of energy in the world, uh, since the federal government purchases thousands of vehicles a month, that he would just execute an executive order that says, after September 30th, we're not going to purchase anything that's not a hybrid that doesn't have the dual fuel capacity and that doesn't have the capacity for uh, a plug-in conversion. I can envision this in the West Wing. I can also envision it uh, in the next administration. <laughs> and it would also seem to me that this might be something that even some of our friends uh, who are somewhat skeptical about broader applications, 
in Congress might agree to as far as the Federal Government leading by example. Would any of you have any thoughts about the, the impact of, uh, of, a, of a Federal Government executive order or Federal legislation that would mandate the Federal Government do this within six months, a year, and let uh, those market signals ripple out? Well, I, I think you're right that, that my character would advise President Bartlett that that might be a, a pretty good idea. And I, and I do think perhaps it's, it's an opportunity to, to tell Detroit, look, we're going to pre-order a large number of these. You know, you're not going to go broke when you have the federal government buying X amount of vehicles. And, and I, listen, I'm really sympathetic to those concerns. I think we need to buttress that industry, and, and we need to, to not penalize that industry to the extent that we can. But, you know, there's been such a lack of the bully pulpit on, on issues like this. And, 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 and there's enough blame to go around. It's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. It, it just has not been at the forefront of the debate that it needs to be, particularly in a, in, in a time of, of war. This should be, we should be hearing as much about this as our plans in the Middle East as we're hearing about anything else, and we just hear nothing. And, and I'm hopeful that that will change in the next administration, regardless of what party controls the White House. Could I just add, I, there's no reason why this should wait for the next administration. The President has diagnosed our condition as addicted to oil. This President, I mean, you talk about Nixon going to China, this is an opportunity, I've argued it with my friends in the administration, this is an opportunity for this President to make, you're absolutely right, the federal government an early adopter that will enormously catalyze the kinds of industrial retooling and changes that are required from both a national security and an economic point of view. I, and I, just I'd to like add to... one final, there's one specific part of the government that is made to order for plug-in hybrids, and that's the U.S. postal system. You look at the, how their vehicles are used, the, it's just a, a no-brainer right. that they should be moving to this right. technology. Uh, it's an important uh, message for me on the problem that we face in trying to execute uh, more efficient uh, battery systems, and it's the same thing carries across into flex fuels and the like. At the working level, uh, we go into our business partners in industry that have tremendous resources and say, we want you to work on such and such chemical that will have a huge impact. And they say there is no demand. Yep. They say there is no market. When you get a market and there is a demand, we will come back and work on it. I am talking about major multinationals in, New in North America today and around the world. Three years ago, I went forward and said, hey, we have got brand new technology. And I sat with some major corporations and said, we are going to start moving in this area. They said, you are kidding yourself. There is no market. What the government needs to do is demonstrate that there is a market and a capability. That is what you would do with that activity. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your courtesy. Uh, I feel extraordinarily strongly that a recommendation come from this committee that the Federal Government be that early adopter, that the Federal Government work with uh, friends like here on this panel to it, decide what is the earliest feasible date uh, that we set down a marker. Uh, I am mindful that uh, the war in Iraq is the most energy-intensive military operation in the history of the world, four times more intense than the first Gulf War, 16 gallons per, of fuel per day per soldier. Uh, it's putting our soldiers' lives at risk. It's costing an inordinate amount of money. This would have a broad ripple effect, and I would hope we could work with the committee and our friends here to establish that marker and move it forward. Mr. Markey. I, I, accept, I, I, I think that the gentleman has made an excellent suggestion, and I would, uh, I would recommend that we work with the Republicans on the committee uh, to adopt that as a recommendation. Um, Mr. Gentleman, Chairman. Time has expired. I apologize to you. We need a, um, a just unanimous consent for the gentleman from Washington State to ask one quick question before we end the hearing. I'm going to ask each one of the witnesses at the conclusion of the question from Mr. Inslee to each give us a one-minute summary statement of what you want the committee to remember as we leave. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. View, I wanted to make sure that we had clarity. I was asking about costs, both of the batteries and operating costs, and I wanted to make sure we got the, uh, the, the right answer. Um, and I want to ask you, when, when these batteries become part of the original manufacturing, when it's not a conversion, but when, in fact, it's part of the original manufacturing, we're doing 200,000 units every couple months. This is a mainstream 
part of the industry, and I believe we are going to get to that position. When we get to that position, could you give us first a projection what that cost may be relative to just a hybrid today, and I'm realizing it's just a projection, and second, what the per mile cost at that point will be of, the, of running the car when it's, on a, when it's on the electrical mode versus gasoline per mile today. Again, these are projections, but if you can just give us the best shot, we'd appreciate it. Uh, on, on the first part, I think I can give a pretty clear answer. The second part may be a little more challenging for me. The, uh, on the cost of the systems today, as we talk about a system that is available for less than $10,000 next year, coming down in the range of uh, 40 percent over a uh, three to five year period, this is a system that we create which has redundant capabilities in it to an existing vehicle. We must create a system that adds um, more materials and more competency than if you put it in the car. So. Clearly, if you build the system into the car, which is being done today, the cost is going to be significantly less, and I would say it will be in the range of another 30 to 40 percent less than that by eliminating redundant components. So uh, take that $10,000 system down to uh, $3,000 or $4,000, and you have a system that um, could be implemented to create um, 80 percent fuel savings and 60 percent reduction emissions. I don't have a number on top of my head that tells you on a per mile basis exactly what that translates into. Um, I'm not sure if I can get any help from anyone here. It would be about two to three cents a mile, according to my colleague. And I think clearly you, you'll save money over the life of the car with those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. View. Let's, let's go in reverse order of the uh, opening statements, and we'll ask each one of our witnesses uh, to now give us their uh, concluding comments that they want the committee to remember as we're moving forward with policy making this year. We'll begin with you, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, from Austin Energy's uh, viewpoint, what we've tried to do with plug-in partners is actually uh, create a market research uh, uh, program for the automakers to demonstrate to them that there actually is a market out there from our vast number of partners. Uh, there's a lot of interest in buying these cars. The only thing we ever get asked is how soon can we get them. Um, our view is that the Congress, through its uh, appropriations, can support advanced battery research to make sure that the battery problem gets solved, and then at that point it becomes incentives uh, both from the Federal Government's purchase of these vehicles to incentives for consumers to purchase these vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Mr. Gaffney. Mr. Chairman, a, a quick point on Mr. Blumenauer's last comment. Um, not only is this an intensive energy demanding environment in Iraq, one of the most dangerous things we are doing is moving fuel around inside the country. So there is a tremendous imperative. I mentioned I was on a defense science uh, board review of this. There is intense interest in figuring out how to make the Defense Department more energy independent. And this technology, I think, can play a role. We should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. We should be moving aggressively to facilitate an industrial base that taps into the best of these technologies and does so, I think, in a dynamic way. I am all in favor of an executive order. I would be delighted to work with you uh, on that if I could. Um, I think one of the issues we are going to bump up against probably in crafting it is trying to encourage American sources to be utilized, especially as that conflicts for reasons we have been talking about all morning with how fast can you do it. And finally, Mr. Chairman, as I have said in my testimony repeatedly, there is a national security imperative to all of this. We are, I believe, in mortal peril of an oil collapse of some kind. I don't know whether it will be terrorists taking out a key facility or whether it is some government or other deciding not to sell us, but this is a peril that we see coming. We need to be doing all of these things as aggressively as possible. I commend to you, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit it for the record, the Set America Free Blueprint that this coalition of national security-minded people, labor people, uh, all different kinds of environmentalists and so on have come together around specifically because I think what it suggests is we will wind up doing every single one of these recommendations later, if not sooner, and later is going to be harder. My father always said try to start out where you are going to be forced to wind up because it is uh, prettier that way. So we, we hope that we are now on that new course. I thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Uh, Mr. Lowe. Um, the first money I ever made as an actor when I had a moment to invest it, I invested it in an alternative energy source. That was over 20 years ago. So this is a, an area that I have cared about for a long time. But it is recent events in the world um, 
global warming reaching this sort of critical mass that has gotten me off the sidelines and, and brought me here today. Um, I'm not a, a big proponent of taxes. I'm just not. That said, I do think there's a time when you invest in something that has a potential to create new industry, particularly the kind of new industry that secures our nation and cleans our environment. So I would urge you and your colleagues to do whatever you can to help, whether it's by the early user tax credits or any other economic incentives that you can come up with to jumpstart this industry, particularly with the, the plug-in hybrid cars that are ready to go on the road today. Thank you, Mr. Law, very much. And uh, Mr. View. Um, in January, Bob Lutz, the Vice Chairman of General Motors, stepped up in front of the public and said that he's found some battery technology in Boston, Massachusetts that's changing their view about um, the limitations of batteries, and they believe that the technology exists today sufficiently so that they were willing to commit to uh, a new model of electric vehicle based around this competency. Um, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. I think the strongest message that we can make is that we don't believe that you have any uh, legislative opportunity in front of you that can provide a greater return um, for a limited investment using current infrastructure than what we are talking about today in the near term. And so we, we appreciate the effort that you have, and we hope that you can continue with your efforts and support this activity. Thank you, Mr. View, very much. And, uh, and I know, Mr. View, that your technology comes from MIT. Um, when the Soviet Union challenged us with Sputnik, um, President Kennedy asked Jerome Wiesner, a professor from MIT, to become his science advisor and to help to shepherd through this goal of putting a man on the moon and returning them to Earth in eight years, and we were successful. Uh, when the uh, Soviet Union um, uh, threatened us um, and potentially with a nuclear strike that could destroy our communications capacity, MIT developed a new, techno a new technology that first was called DAPANET and is now called the Internet, and we have deployed it ubiquitously around the world. Hopefully your technology, the technology at A123, which has come out of MIT, uh, can be embraced as well, uh, at least uh, as a concept that not only uh, your company but uh, dozens of other companies uh, could uh, ex accept this challenge. Uh, to give us the capacity to break our dependence upon imported oil, but to give this technology to the rest of the world as well. It, it is that important for our energy security, but also our national security. Uh, and, uh, and this panel, I think, has helped uh, to really focus us on this issue. Uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, created this select committee as her only select committee in her first two years as Speaker of the House and it was to have these kinds of hearings. And I can promise you that in the legislation, which we're considering this year, uh, the kind of tax incentives, regulatory changes are now being seriously considered uh, that can hopefully open up uh, these new technologies to adoption and to telescope the time frame it takes uh, in order to see them uh, deployed ubiquitously, not only across our country, but across the world. We thank you for your testimony today. This hearing is adjourned. Boy, you had a big impact. Oh, my God. It's not all bad. Yeah. <laughs>